Welcome back to In Other Waters. Last episode, we just came back from the Brine Pools, this huge area where we discovered a massive amount of things and got a massive amount of samples. And also found the crashed ROV that was over on this side, so now there's just the other one over here to get. But this episode, we're not going to be getting this one, because we have a lot of things to do and examine and read. We have a new habitat entry, we have a million things, a million samples to, to check out. And then we also now have the cutting device, which will allow us to get into that special place that has the last sample we need for the blood froth stuff. So, yeah, first thing, get some samples going. Sold out of that last one. Okay, oh, hold on. Wait, did it not do it? No relevant taxonomy entries found. Oh, so we can't do that one. It's also this one. Is this also the same problem? Yep, okay. And all of the updates are in the animals. Lungcrest. We have everything for it. Lungcrests resemble large crabs in their basic anatomy, though they're instantly recognizable by the large, multi-chambered bubbles they carry on their backs. The function of these bubbles is unclear, but each individual produces slightly different bubble forms, and individuals have also been observed with their bubbles at different levels of inflation. They seem to be filled with gas, but without analyzing one directly, we cannot know which gases. To feed, lung crests use their complex mouth parts to chew up silt and rock, slowly and systematically working through their territory. These territories seem to be unique to each creature, and I've yet to see one lung crest trespassing on another individual's garden. A direct sample of their mucus bubbles might help us understand more about their behavior. Behavior. After finding a shed lung crest bubble, it has been possible to analyze its contents. The majority of the bubble is filled with oxygen, with some amounts of methane, nitrogen, and carbon dioxide. It seems that in its processing of minerals and compounds found in the silt and rock of the ocean floor, lung crests are able to produce and process these gases, perhaps with the help of a bacterial symbiont living inside their bodies. But what are they producing these bubbles for? It could be that their defensive structures, able to be shed and popped when the relatively slow-moving and vulnerable lung crests need to escape. But then why the carefully managed cocktail of gases? Further investigation is needed. In particular, we should look to inspect a lung crest shell. Sampling a lung crest shell has made the function of their mucus-lined bubbles clear. After seeing lung crests scavenging around and even entering into the brine pools, it seems obvious that their bubbles are in fact natural scuba gear, allowing them to move around the anoxic environment of the brine lake. The shell confirms this, with a clear vent in the shell which allows the lung crest to access the gas within the bubble without breaking it. This unique evolution means that despite their slow speed and sheer ignorance of what goes on around them, lung crests are highly resilient, their thick shells and bubble crests together forming a kind of analog of my own dive suit. I'll be sure to say hello to these fellow divers the next time we visit the Brine Lake. <laughs> fellow divers. Hey, friends. I was imagining a relatively small bubble on their back, but actually, no, it's, it looks like it's a bunch of bubbles all together. Bigger than their own body. So I'm understanding this picture, right? I think I am. 
Yeah, they have a pretty large supply of spare oxygen and other gases. Brine Strider, we have everything. Brine Striders are towering crab-like creatures which live among the brine pools. Their tall, reed-like legs keep their carapace from the toxic waters that claim most of their creatures. The bones and shells of creatures that die to the brine pools adorn Strider's carapaces, pulled from the brine by a pair of extended claws. Among these rocky piles, smears of bioluminescence glow blue. This pulsing life, whatever it is, finds shelter in the remains the Striders collect. But why do the Striders make these creatures a home in the first place? I'm also curious how, if the Striders are vulnerable to the brine, do adolescents reach the heights required to survive? In order to understand more about these obscure creatures, perhaps we need to analyze the glowing brine-clogged remains they gather. Behavior Analysis of a brine-clogged shell reveals a complex chain of chemical reactions. Among this chemical richness, a form of extremophile bacteria feeds on the brine's chemical traces. When the striders collect these remains, they also collect the bacterial colonies which, which live on them. Removed from the brine, but still feeding on the chemical saturated shells and bones, these bacterial colonies produce a bright glow, a side effect of their metabolism. Do the striders know that they're turning themselves into pale beacons? What is the nature of the relationship between these bacteria and the striders? I need to understand more about the life cycle of a strider and how they grow to such heights. Analysis of a juvenile strider's carapace paints an enigmatic but beautiful picture. The adornments of shell and bone only begin as the brine strider matures, each arrangement being the life's work of that individual. Though the striders often live apart from each other, it seems that they still communicate. Their adornments, which grow taller and brighter, act as beacons. They can signal for food, signal to mate, they keep company from afar. Gathering the remains in their glowing bacterial colonies is a ritualistic process, a way for each of these large and ponderous creatures to create an identity within this ecosystem through a living, growing work of biological sculpture. That is so interesting. Eaters. Brine eaters are hairy, frond like creatures that live in clumps around Gliese 667cc's deep ocean brine pools. Looking like large, dark, overgrown ferns, they sway their branching limbs through the pools, whisking the cloudy brine as they do. Each frond is thick with bristles, which are often caked in a bright orange substance that reacts to the brine on contact, brightening as it does. What exactly this substance is, or does, is difficult to tell but it seems that the eaters intentionally foster its growth on their limbs, using their matted hair to keep it attached. Individual eaters can be hard to isolate from the clumps they live in, making additional observations difficult. Understanding more about these creatures will require us to gather some samples. Analyzing samples of the bacteria which grows among the hairs of the brine eater's fronds has shown that it is their main source of nutrition. This bacteria, which is extremophile in nature, is able to metabolize the toxic brine the eater dips it into. If the eater repeatedly dips the bacteria into the brine in order to regulate its growth, with each dip causing a rapid increase in reproduction within the bacterial colony. When the eater's limb is thick with orange microbes, it then wipes it across another frond, where much of the bacteria is quickly digested by the creature, leaving just enough behind in the limb to regrow the colony. It seems the name brine eater is a misnomer, it's the bacteria which eats the brine, and eaters just consume the bacteria. Inspecting the tissue of a brine eater shows that despite a full nervous system, they have no central brain. In fact, regeneration present in the tissue sample suggests that a brine eater could be regrown from just a single piece of an individual, and is highly resistant to predatory damage. With no central self to orient themselves around, brine eaters are a highly resilient form of life which is perhaps how they've come 
to exist in one of the harshest environments of Gliese 667cc, uh, the shore of a brine lake. They're so resilient, in fact, that I would expect that brine eaters and their variants might be found all across this ocean. Each one grown from the smallest fragment of one original individual deep in the past of this planet. I don't know why, but I was expecting, uh, for some reason, I, ex I was expecting a creature with some legs and stuff to be able to move around with large fronds coming off of it, but this kind of looks like the entire creature is the fronds. Okay, we have another entry. Is Manet still Manet? What has this place done to her? I've barely been able to leave the medical level, though I dare not enter the surgery. Did she do this by choice? For those few months on Kepler-62F, it was clear that Manet was struggling with something. We never spoke about it, but behind her intensity lay a frenzied self-doubt. She never talked about her family. All I knew was that she was a rare spacer born out in the black, on some orbital military base. Some days she wouldn't leave the berth, just curled up so small, staring silently out. Would she do this on purpose? Open up her suit and willingly slip into the deep? I suppose it doesn't matter now. All I can do is monitor her. At least I'm not alone. Oh, we can actually see lots of dots. Ellery did say Manet is growing. God. Some real sci-fi horror stuff. Vital signs unclear. Foreign genetic material detected. Rapi rapid tissue growth. Error. Okay, well, with all that done, we have two things to do before I go to the other ROV. Um, oh wait, never mind, we don't have two things to do before that, we have one thing to do. I thought there was a sample we hadn't discovered here, but now it's marked off the map now that we've scanned and looked at everything, so... Yeah, I, I got everything over there. It's just this. Now that we have the cutting tool, let's head there. What are we doing out here, picking through the remains of the bloom? Yes, uh, I hope you can speak fast, because our oxen's going away. No more wandering, we should be heading deeper. That's where the answers lie. Call in the drone, let's find that final ROV. Wait, can I... I can't! Huh. Okay, I can't do this yet. Interesting. That makes me think even more that it's going to be something really, really big. The source of the bloom. Back to the dusk slopes then, and this time we go north... northwest. Declining slope. The pale floor descends rapidly away from the ridge in this direction, towards a field of shadowy outcrops. Oh, are you a new creature? Complex creature? What is that? 
It looks like a whole menagerie of creatures, caught in a silken net. A mass of tentacles and growths unlike anything I've seen. It's difficult to understand the anatomy of these creatures just by looking. Basalt Towers. Another group of towers rises towards the pale light, each strata piled with silver silt. Shadowed Gap. In the shadow of the towers, there's a deep silence. Pale Passage. From between the towers, a pale blue light flickers over the rocks. Veil Tangle. The veils reach out towards the black basalt towers, emanating flashes of cyan light. More veils. We need to be careful. There has to be a way to find the path through. Clear water. A gap has opened up between the veils, allowing passage between their gauzy bodies. Hold on, uh, I'm curious. I assume that this was kind of an extra way to go, and this is the main way, going straight north. But perhaps not. Wide gap. Flanked by the towers, this pass leads ever deeper down the slope. Veil Field. Veils shimmer along the slope, marked with both glittering lights and the dark remains of those creatures who strayed too close. Yeah, they all seem to lead places. Well, this way it goes through a veil, which isn't that big of a deal. Doesn't hurt our oxygen that much, really. But let's try the other way. It'll probably link up with that one up there. I hope. Splitting Veil. This veil is in the process of splitting away from the rest of its body. Is this how veils are born, or is this an injury? Tangled Edge. Or Tangle Edge, rather. Even on the far side of the tangle, the veil's lights can be overwhelming, multiplying my shadow in all directions. Points of light. With the blinding veils behind me, I notice smaller pinpricks of light moving across the slope. There are other creatures here. Those are new, but first let's go back. Strobing veil. This close to a veil, the light is unbearably intense, its repeated patterns leaving ghosts on my retinas. Okay, yeah, that just is where we would have got with the other way. Whoa, look at those things that just came out of it. That's the complex creature. I wonder if that's tentacles that we're seeing. Occasionally, this creature stops and unfolds its tentacles and chambers to cover a broad area of water. Is it hunting? Overgrown outcrop. This outcrop hides a wealth of life, from long-legged crawlers and filter feeders to blurred shapes which flit through the suit's lamps. Name them water bulbs. I'm calling these cryptic creatures water bulbs. Let's see what we can uncover about them back at the lab. Partially transparent egg-shaped creatures which feed by filtering water. A strange sphere sits inside their iridescent interior. Pale Petals. On closer inspection, these petals are solid growths, not fragile objects. They sit like thin tree stumps in the sand, each on its own wide stalk. 
quite fan. Unlike the Bloom's fans, these deepwater variants are covered with a translucent sheath of mucus, which protects their delicate spines. Glowing fan. This huge curved fan glows with a warm bioluminescence. Waves of amber light pass up its considerable height. Fan sheath, something we've already gotten before. Cold Fire Bathers. I'm going to name these Cold Fire Bathers. They seem to be strongly linked to the light of these fans. These wide, petal shaped plants gather in groups and grow in the light of deep sea fans. Their pollen fills the water around each stem. Deep Oasis. From this side, this arrangement of pulsing and glowing forms, nestled into the basalt, is a sanctuary of life and warming light. Uh. Ovular growths. Standing beside these clusters of egg-like forms, I can feel them filtering huge volumes of seawater in pulsing gulps. Downward slope. Away from the outcrop, the silty slope begins to descend again. Fast creature. A better look at these creatures shows that they're swimming with their rear legs while using their tails to propulse themselves somehow. Veil field. A large field of veils whose pale blue light appears unpleasantly cold in comparison to the warmth of the oasis. No wonder Benet's ROVs never returned. These veils are everywhere. Like on Earth. They must rely on predation to survive this deep, where little sunlight reaches. Bright veils. A large tangle of veils stretches out ahead, producing a cyan light that softly flickers in the dark. Veil field. The veils here create a set of gauzy walls closing off the ocean around. Tangled Veils. The Tangled Veils create a translucent, twitching maze. Veil Clearing. Who knows how temporary these gaps in the walls of veils are. We should make use of them while we can. Hypnotic Lights. There's beauty to being inside a field of veils, a song of light that makes it impossible to keep a sense of direction. These looped veils are carrying a wave of light that passes from one individual to another and back again. What does this mean? that actually saps a lot of our power. I think when I thought they weren't a big deal, I was thinking of the brine pools, which really aren't a big deal. They're just like the bloom saps your oxygen slowly. But this takes a good chunk of power. Veil Passage. An avenue between the veils. Flickering shapes caught in the suit's lamps suggest other creatures make use of this safe passage too.
Veil edge. Like city lights beyond a curtain, I can see the warm pinpricks of an oasis behind this waxy veil. There's that spot over there, but I don't think I want to go there. Harrowing Passage The veils are coming together ahead. I hope this gap will remain open long enough for us to pass through. There is this spot here. Let's scan it and see if it, there's a sample. A sample candidate. Some creature has shed or lost a segment of its tail shell here. Among the veils. It looks small enough to sample. Okay, we're definitely getting that, but let's do it from over here so we only pass through one veil instead of two. Tail segment. Let's use some of these things, because all of these we've already studied before. So that, and these are fine. That gives oxygen, that's useless. This also gives oxygen, so that's all we're going to get for now. Let me actually go back here then, and scan this and see if this is a sample candidate. No, just a basalt shelf, okay. Creature remains. This veil is hung with the husks of its catches, like dark clouds obscuring the starlit sky of its bioluminescence. Now oh, that's worth some power, the digested remains. Veil field. Past the drifting sheets, another pattern of light skirts around the edges of the tangle. A mutual predator to the veils, perhaps? Tangle edge. A gap in the tightly knotted veils leads to the welcoming amber light of another oasis. Glowing fan. This fan shimmers with waves of cold fire, bathing the surrounding oasis in warm light. Use that for some more power. New species logged, cold fire fan. I'll call these cold fire fans after those mesmerizing flame-like pulses. Filter-feeding fans that, beneath a mucus sheath, pulse with warm light, often surrounded by other creatures benefiting from their glow. Deep Oasis, another garden of creatures, rooted into a dark basalt shelf, welcoming break from the intensity of the veil vale field. complex creature. It's hard to tell if this is a colonial creature or a single individual. Whatever it is, we should keep our distance to avoid those tentacles. Living outcrop. Tiny creatures crawl silently along the layers of dark rock, leaving behind small, strange marks in the shallow silt piles. Ovular growths. These pale, pulsing creatures have noticeable growths budding off from their central form. We could sample them here. Uh. 
ovoid bud. Good amount of power and a little bit of oxygen. Basalt pillar. At the northernmost tip of this outcrop, a dark pillar rises up, its stacked layers edged with pale silt. Fast creature. These creatures seem to follow the same routes back and forth through the veils. Why do they limit themselves to these pathways? Abyssal sail shell. I'm calling these abyssal sail shells. Those wide tail plates are instantly recognizable. A small dark creature with a large translucent tail shell that allows it to rapidly move through the water, navigating the veil tangles safely. Small burrow. At the edge of the outcrop in the light sand slope, a shallow burrow leads down. Eggs glint within. We could sample them here. Beaded eggs, a string of orange eggs found in the deep ocean. Bare outcrop. This side of the outcrop where the warm light of the fan does not reach is absent of life. Shelf edge. At the basalt shelf, as the basalt shelf sinks back into the silt, the ocean floor falls away into a huge field of glittering veils. Veil loop. A group of looped veils output the same pattern in an ornate game of call and response. Are they communicating with each other? Veil field. Away from the outcrops, the veils claim what territory they can. This field is the largest I've seen, wandering away into the deep. Veil gap. A split in the veils leads into their ornate interior. Navigating this huge tangle will be a struggle. Veil clearing. The veils are reaching in towards this point on the ocean floor, like vines seeking the sun. With all these orbiting polyps and strings, I'm naming this creature the Deep Orary. Orary. An ornate creature that casts a net-like arrangement of tentacles and polyps to shock passing prey into submission. Twisting Passage. Here the walls of veils come in close, turning away from the core of the tangle at strange angles. Mirrored Veils. The veils on each side are mimicking each other, both in shape and pattern. They're pulsing lights, playing a mirror game. Volcanic Shelf. A large basalt pillar sits on the shelf, its dark skin textured by the lights of the nearby tangle. Deep Oasis. The glow of an amber fan and the soft shapes of its petal audience can be seen just behind the black rock. I don't think I have room. No. Not that I need deep pollen, but I should get rid of some of the deep pollen. I don't need it. I've already studied it. And it only gives me oxygen, which I already have plenty of. I think they reacted to my scan. I'm sorry. Glowing fan. 
Shielded from the veils by the basalt pillars, this fan hosts a small colony of petals, their spores speckled across its sheath. That can give me a ton of power. Yeah, let's do that. Exposed roots. The petals here have had their roots dug up by some creature. We could take a sample of them here. Petal root. The bulbous roots of deep sea plant life from a glowing oasis. Bright tangle. These glittering veils have formed a close perimeter around the outcrop, but seem to be keeping their distance. Oh! I didn't scan. Or I did, but like not. They didn't react when I scanned. Only a couple seconds later, so I don't think it was the scan. Ovular growths. At the tip of the shell, fed by a soft current, these creatures pump moving water around the outcrop. Is this why the veils stay away? Because of the moving water? Basalt outcrop. At the far side of the veil field, this outcrop sits silently, dappled with warm pockets of life. Veil Waste Pile Bodies of creatures that were trapped in the veils lie piled in the silt. The veils must pass them here from tangle to tangle. Tangle Gap This gap between tangles allow allows passage further down the slope. I'm going to go back this way first, though. Veil clearing. Another clearing in the field surrounded by possible routes both through and past the flickering veils. Veil field. The curving walls lead to another gap in the tangle filled with light and movement. From this middle point of the tangle, it's impossible to see beyond the glimmering walls to the ocean beyond. Other lights. Among the hypnotic patterns of the veils, other lights move. Pinpricks like LEDs, shifting in the loose orbit of an unseen body. Veil Passage. The tangle turns back on itself, revealing new paths into its interior. Fail clearing. A gap in the middle of the tangle where the lights are dimmer. The sickening, shifting sensation lessened. Narrow gap. Here the veils close in towards each other, sheets passing up against one another with gentle waves. Veil corner. The veils meet here, but through their translucent skin I can see the dark shape of an outcrop. Tangled outcrop. Unlike the other outcrops, this dark rock is being invaded by the veils, subsumed by the tangles. Yeah, why this one and not the others? Because of the lack of those creatures that I already forgot the name of, the ones that push water all over the place. I kind of want to go there and just take the power hit. Yeah. Ow. Fading fan. A 
wilted fan faintly pulses while spines of its body have broken away, still faintly glowing in the silt. We could sample them here. Yeah, it's because there's no... There's no fan here, or at least no remotely alive fan here to keep them away. The tangles, the veils. Glowing spine. A spine from a glowing fan still faintly pulsing with warm light. Oh, this give a lot of power. Glistening object. Something clouded and purple glints in the silt beyond the veil. It looks small enough to sample whole. Alright, this is gonna hurt. Ow. And... Oh. Maybe there's like a, uh... Like an immunity period so you don't get hit with a bunch of them back to back? We didn't get hit by passing through the second line. I think we're full, yeah. Okay, let's get some power back. Uh, I suppose that's fine. Yeah, let's use another one. Shed polyp. A polyp from a colonial life form lost on the ocean floor. Dark outcrop. Though the veils are encroaching on its position, the outcrop silently holds out against their cold chemical light. Yeah, this is going to hurt too. Glowing Garden. Another refuge in these dark waters, glowing with life. Tangle Edge. Here the veils part, looping back towards their fellow tangles. Just want to see where this hooks up. Oh. Did that just sap my energy? Veil Clearing. Another piece of territory yet to be claimed by the strange patterns of the veil field. Translucent shell. A shell segment gleams among a large number of semi-digested husks dumped by the veils. It looks small enough to sample. Heck yeah. Oh, tail segment. We've already got one. What does it give? Tiny bit of power. Boop. Oh. Should I go over there? Should I go over there right now? Hmm. Narrow gap. Two veils that, uh, that look like they've recently split present a narrow gap in this maze. Twisted veils. I'm starting to think there's some battle for territory between the veils as they search for the best spots to cast their nets. And now we've looped around. Uh, let's go over here first, and then I'll go back over that way. Glowing fan. Surrounded by its audience of light bathing petals, the fan's sheath shimmers with amber light like a bonfire. Don't need a fan sheath, but I can use it for... Power. Deep oasis. Among the elegant shapes of the petals, among the elegant shapes of the petals, small, stilt-legged creatures stride, cleaning particles from their pitted surfaces. Fading petals. At the edge of the light from the fan, the petals are pale and twisted away, perhaps turning to another source of food.
basalt pillar. Faint flickers of light silhouette a tall pillar of basalt shards rising up into the faint blue glow above. Dying Veil Twisted back on itself, this veil is being eaten away by the creatures, its defensive abilities neutered. We could sample some tissue here. I'm definitely going to need more room, so let's toss out the sphere fragment. Veil field. The tangles of veils close around the outcrop here, encasing it in a prison of... In prison of glinting light. I think you just stole some of my power. Sneaky bugger. Okay, I think this leads over to that island we see at the far top right of the screen, which is probably where we have to go. You know what that means. If that's where we have to go, then I'm not going there. split. One tangle has split away from another here, moving down the slope away from the field. Oh, we've already been over here. Okay. Veil passage. As tangles split away from each other, the density of the field starts to thin out. Oh, I think this just hooks up with where we were going anyway. Tangle edge. The veils thin out, the last of their light falling across the sandy slopes as it descends into deeper water. Clear water. The tangle's behind us now, leaving only the dark of the deep ocean ahead. Descending slope. The slope continues its irresistible, irresistible descent towards the distant abyssal plain. Rock shelf. Another shelf appears out of the dark, but nowhere on its surface can I see the warm glow of a fan. I bet this is where the ROV is going to be. In fact, I think I see the wreckage. Basalt outcrop. Unlike the other outcrops, this one is free of life. Is proximity to the veils vital for the other colonies' coexistence? Uh, this links back up with where we came from, so it's probably not important, but I want to check it out anyway. Dark water. Outside the reach of the veils, the dark, cool water is a welcome change from the incoherent patterns of light. We seem to be through. No more veils ahead. Clear water. Guess there's no reason to read that. Um, I don't think there's any need to go there. Because it's so close to where we already were, and that is itself not a sample. So I don't think we're going to find anything. Then again, it is possible from there I can find another point that I couldn't see from any of the other points. Disabled ROV. Another of Manet's ROVs scattered across the outcrop. We should be, st we should still be able to use its transmission core to reach the base. 
Here, in the middle of the outcrop. A ROV. This one was carrying a supply cache, too. We can recharge and refill our oxygen. Let's access its map data. Open up the terminal when you're ready.